my name is Eric Martinez, and we're going to talk about Docker image development. Um, I am not a clever person. I don't think of creative things. I'm very practical. I'm an application developer. Um, hence the talk, Docker image development. It's kind of like straight to the point. It's not clever or funny in any ways. But I work for the US Geological Survey at the National Earthquake Information Center over in Golden, Colorado. I've been there for about 15 years doing website, web application development, and then also a lot of underlying infrastructure development as well. Um, so there a long time. We have a pretty large website that gets a lot of active users. Um, we have about 300,000 page views in any given day, and that re relates to about 57 million requests. Now, our pages aren't that heavy. We don't get like thousands of requests per um, page view. It's actually most of our uh, content that we serve is going to be data requests, so APIs that we have available. There's a lot of applications, uh, iOS, Android applications, that are using our data, and that's where most of those requests are coming from. So we get a lot of traffic on any given day, but it's also generated um, by earthquakes. So when earthquakes occur, people want more information about these earthquakes, and then they come to our site, and they get this information. So this creates a really unique traffic pattern. And uh, why do I bring all this up? We're talking about Docker image development. Well, this was the motivation for why we figured this out and how to move into um, Docker images for our applications. So that's just the only reason I bring that up. So real quick, of course, obligatory XKCD comic. You can read that quickly. Um, I'm going to talk about these three main topics. The focus is going to be image development, but you're probably going to need to have like some infrastructure in front of that to use the images that you create effectively. And then you're also going to want to know how to deploy that um, once you get your images, how to deploy it into your infrastructure. So we're going to talk briefly about those as well. Um, and hopefully, by the end, it doesn't feel like we're just like gluing things together, that we actually have a, a solution that's going to make sense. And also, maybe some demos. I don't know. I don't, maybe, maybe we'll have time. Um, so the infrastructure first. First thing to talk about is servers. Um, these can be like on-prem servers. They can be virtualized. They can be in the cloud. But you do need to have some place to, de to deploy these, right? And we're going to talk about mostly um, Docker and Docker Swarm. But this would apply equally to things like Kubernetes or other type of platforms. Um, so you can think about this in terms of Docker Swarm if you want to take this just kind of as is and use the information I'm presenting. Um, but you can also kind of see how would this adapt into Kubernetes. A lot of this stuff is like one-to-one -one or very analogous. Um, and then you can also think about if you're using a platform like OpenShift or Pivotal or something like that, what kind of features, how would you, how would you implement the same types of ideas or concepts in those? And, and mostly those are really, really solid platforms as well. So you can do a lot of the same stuff that I'm going to talk about today. So one thing to think about is your cluster uh, robustness. You want to make sure you have a robust infrastructure underlying all of your applications. And this is just kind of a little plot here to show you, like, more is not always better. Cluster is going to be made up of worker nodes and um, manager nodes. A manager node kind of manages the cluster. It determines where your containers are going to be deployed when you actually deploy a container. Um, and then it also watches them and makes sure that, like, if a container fails, I'm going to spin another one up over here. If this whole server goes away, I'm going to redistribute the load so that all of your applications stay running and stay healthy, and you're not like getting calls at 3 in the morning, why are my applications down? But when it comes to managers, um, more is not always better. You can see your actual um, failure rates have all this kind of like wavy, sine curve. Um, and in general, odd is always better than, than even. Um, so if you're going to go to four servers, four is actually going to introduce more vulnerabilities to your system than if you had three. There's no numbers on there because on, on the y-axis because that actually varies based on how robust or what's the likelihood of one server failing, and that's obviously going to change depending on your server. So you have to figure that out. If you want to know the actual numbers, it's going to be dependent on your physical deployment. Um, the other kind of infrastructure thing that I want to talk about is you need to have a good place to like store your images. You're going to build all these images. You need to store them someplace, and that's going to be in an image registry. Docker pre provides one to you um, called Docker Hub. And then they also have an enterprise version where you can do Docker trusted registries, um, authentication and all of that, make private, private images and things, and signing. There's a lot, of, a lot of infrastructure out there. But you do need to have some place in there. And it needs to be trusted. Um, for what we do, we actually have an on-prem um, image registry. But we also uh, deploy out to Docker Hub so that you can actually share your images. But also, you have something kind of like 
more private, more secure for the stuff that you're going to deploy onto your systems. And then the last part is just like automation. And so that's going to be the first thing I'll talk about in a little bit more depth is just the automation workflows. So uh, we use Jenkins because, again, as a government agency, we have to kind of meet some certain security requirements in what we do. But there's a lot of good open platforms as well. I think there's talks about like Circle CI. Um, you could use that for your automation as well, for your continuous integration, con continuous delivery. Um, there's a lot of different tools out there that are just open. Some are free, some you pay for. Probably as a business, you'd, you'd want to buy like a paid for version. Um, but use what you like. We're using Jenkins and we're running this on-prem. It's a little bit more work for us. But you can see here, and what I'm showing is we build is kind of like the first pipeline that we have on all of our applications, and we deploy. Those are two separate pipelines, and one will trigger the other. So when we build, we build it, we build master when it, when it gets committed, and then it automatically goes out to our development staging system so that we're able to test that and look and see all of our stuff get integrated, go out immediately. We know our pipelines are working. We know our applications are working. Um, and then we can go in manually or automatically if we wanted to um, and deploy the same thing to production. Now, when we actually build, we build these images and we push a copy up into Docker Hub. So all of our applications, you can just go and if you wanted to run one of our applications, you can just run it on your laptop and it would work out of the box. You don't have to know anything. You just basically Docker run and it runs. We've, we've developed them. It takes a little bit of extra work to develop your applications to do that, but we do it. Um, and then we put everything into an internal registry as well. And then the internal registry is the thing that we actually use when we want to deploy our applications because that way we know it's secure. We know no one's like messed with it. We're monitoring that registry. We have a lot of security around it. But that's the general setup. You can do this with a lot of different technologies. And then this shows we also are using um, two clusters. They're mirrors of each other and Jenkins or whatever automation system you're using is going to keep them in sync by like whenever I deploy to cluster A, I deploy to cluster B as well. But they're independent. So they're not, this is not part of like the um, cluster swarm or anything like that. This is just going to be uh, two independent clusters. And within those clusters, we have different nodes. All of our nodes are managers and workers. Um, a manager, again, manages all of the workers. And then the workers are the ones that actually perform the work. They actually are running the, the images for you. But you can make one, one both or just one or the other if you want to. If you want it to be strictly a worker, um, it doesn't have to be a manager. Or if it's a manager, it's going to by default be a worker, but you can do what's called drain the node. Um, and then that won't actually accept any uh, deployments. So that's it for infrastructure. There's a lot more to talk about that. That could be like a whole talk or a whole day of just talking about how to set up all of your infrastructure. But I don't. that's not the, the goal here. I'm going to spend most of my time in this next section, um, image development. And there's great documentation online for Docker. You can read all about it at that link. Um, and they'll go around all, all the different instructions. Each one of these is like an instruction, is what they call it. Um, and this is, how you, this is how you build your image. It's, it's, you put these into a Docker file. I'm not going to go over the details of all of these, but I do want to go into some of the subtleties into how you can kind of use these a little bit more um, effectively uh, or maybe a little bit like the cleverness, you know, that I said I'm not clever. Well, I'm not clever in like an artsy or funny way, um, but I can be clever sometimes in how I can abuse these instructions. Um, so the, these ones in bold are the ones I'm going to go over a little bit more details. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on the other ones as well. So first one I want to talk about is arg. Uh, arguments uh, to me, but you know, I was actually making this slide, and, and my girlfriend was sitting next to me. She's like, arg, like a pirate. And I was like, no, not like a pirate at all. <laughs> but you know, full disclosure, she's a seventh grade math teacher, and she does presentations for kids all the time. She's like, they'll love it. And it's like a pirate. And it's like, she has to make corny jokes to keep seventh graders um, entertained and interested in math, because like, that's, that's hard. Um, so yeah, pirate, because it's args. We're going to talk about that. Uh, this is how you can kind of like customize your build, right, in your Docker file. So what you do is you put arg name equals value, and the value that you put in your Docker file is going to be a default value for your argument. Um, and then what you can do is use, when you're building your actual image using your Docker file, you just say dash dash build dash arg and name equals value. If you don't specify that when you build, you get your default name equals value that was in the Docker file. If you do specify it, 
it will override the value, and, and that's, how, that's why it's an argument, because you can change it, um, right? The trick to this is if you put the arguments before your from, the from is the instruction that tells you like what is going to be the basis for my image. So it's like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a, a, a web application, right? I might start from an Apache image or an Nginx image or something like that. That's what you'd use for from. Um, if you put the arg before your from, you can actually use the argument to change your base image. Otherwise, it's pretty, pretty locked in. And why might you want to do this? Well, Typically, it's, it's nice to kind of test or have the default be like latest or something like that. But when you deploy, you really want to lock everything down. You want to make sure that you're not going to deploy one thing to dev and another thing to production or, or to your different environments and be like, why didn't it work? It worked in dev. And you know that, that age old argument that you have with your, your dev and your ops teams. Um, but so in, what you do is you basically, when you want to build these for your, for your deployments, you would lock in or you can even change them. So like when we put our images out there, what I said before, we put them into Docker Hub publicly. Everybody can, you can go download them right now. We also put them into our internal registry. Everything that we deploy and everything that we build is built off of our internal registry, not anything that's out on Docker Hub. But we want this to work. We want you to be able to rebuild these as well. If you download all of our Docker files, everything's open source. Um, so what we put actually in our image files is uh, the Docker Hub references, so like the, the base CentOS image or something like that. But then when we actually build, we switch over and say, use the CentOS that we um, set is good. Uh, so, so that's a little bit of a trick that you can do in order to leverage that same kind of like full transparency but also get security in your Docker images. The next thing is a little bit of a complicated task and it, and it brings in some, some of the other instructions as well. It's not directly tied to an instruction and we're going to talk about copy here in a second. But multi-stage builds are the way that you want to build your applications if you need to say compile them, right? So if you have, say, like an Angular application, or even like if you're writing C code or Java code or something like that, you're going to have the source code in your repository. And your, your build time is going to check out all that source code. And then it's going to compile it into your image, right? Well, you don't want to have like your JDK or your, your GCC compilers or you know, Node or anything like that. Because you don't need all these, all these libraries at runtime when you're actually going to execute your application or serve your application. You don't need those in your image. And it's really hard to kind of like compile all that, bring in all, all of these libraries, and then try to get rid of them if you, if you just used a single stage build. So you use multi-stage builds. And so we create basically like a build environment. And so we can use like um, for an Angular application, for example, you might start with your build environment starting from a node image because it has all the all those things that you might need in order to build an Angular application. And then what you can do is it builds like the bundles, like your main.js, your index.html, things like that, right? Um, and then you can just copy them out of there. And it's all done inside of a container, so you don't need to have any special infrastructure. You don't need to install Node on, on your servers where you're actually building this, this application, because you're actually building it inside of Docker itself. The way you do this is you just say um, from image tag as environment. So like. Uh, we'll see this in an example later, but it looks like from um, node as build env is what we'll do. Later, once once you actually finish your build, your building or your compiling step, you would then copy those out, and that's just on your copy instruction. And it's kind of the next thing we we'll talk about. Um, you would just copy by using dash dash from, and the from would be that stage that we specified. So you can see in the examples here, we said copy from uh, build env. And then we're copying some c files out that we were at, that were actually generated from the source code. So like, you're not going to see that dist folder in my source code, right? That this is an Angular application. Um, so if you're familiar with that, you might you might recognize this. But um, you're not going to see that dist folder in my source code. But that's something that actually came from the build. And then I'm just copying that over into a different image. And then basically that build in image uh, will sit kind of like on the on the building uh, Docker engine, but it doesn't go into your image that you're going to distribute or deploy. Health checks. This one, very important. Like, you hear a lot of things about like Docker and, and all of all of your different um, platforms as a service, um, Pivotal and whatnot. They talk about like being able to auto like self heal, right? Like if your applications go away or, or fail in some way, it can automatically like tear down that application and reprovision a new application and you don't have to deal with anything. Well, health checks are key to that. 
because without a health check, all it does is it makes sure that your process is running. It doesn't make sure that your application is actually healthy. Um, and that's an important part because if you're running an application, say it needs to um, connect to a database to get some data and then it serves that data out to a web application, for example, um, if it can't connect to the database, well, your process, your, your um, Apache process or Nginx or, or Node.js Express server or whatever, it's still running. So by default, Docker, Docker will say like, oh yeah, your, your application is totally healthy. But your users will come and say like, mm, your application's not working, I can't get any data. It just sends some sort of, sort of like database connection error message back. So the way you do that is you write a health check. And now this is built into Dockerfile, but like it's not really gone over in detail a lot. And so what you want to do is use a health check that actually checks the application the way your users might be using your application. So if you have a web service that's getting data from a database, you might make sure that you can get data from a database. If it's like actually calculating certain things, you might want to send it some known inputs, make sure you're getting the known outputs so that you know, nothing's going wrong with your data um, in between so somehow. I don't know all the details of what you might want to check, but there's a couple examples I'll go over here. Um, things I wanted to talk about though is kind of tuning your health checks. So the interval is just going to tell you like how often your health check should run. Um, so 20 seconds. You can use S um, is seconds. You can use other kind of unit specifiers as well. Um, the, the trick to this is this actually runs in your startup time and then forever. As long as your container or your service is running, this is going to run every 20 seconds. So it might be putting some load on your system. So you have to kind of tune that. Like, if you're going to be putting massive load on your system, you, you might have to know yeah, you have to scale your system to be a little bit bigger so that it can deal with like your health check load that you're going to be putting on it. Um, or maybe you just run it less often or something like that. It's also going to be the timeout. So your health check script can run for this long before it just says, like, you know what, your system's not healthy. We're not, it's just hanging, we're not getting responses, it's unhealthy. Um, the start period is kind of a little bit of a tricky one, but and it plays in with, with the interval. But um, with the start period, it says, it says like once when I initially deploy this container, it might take up to a minute for it to become healthy, right? If it's a database, it's spinning everything up, it's loading up these libraries. It might take you like a minute in this example or something for it to become healthy. So even if your health check fails in that first minute, don't worry about it. Don't don't like tear it down and start again because it's always going to take that minute, right? You're, you're not going to be you're not going to be any faster the second time around. Um, but the interval is, is still running on that 20 second interval. So even in, in the startup time, what would be nice is if you could, you know, uh, during startup health check, like once every five seconds until you become healthy. And then once you're healthy, um, maybe only check once a minute or once every five minutes or something like that. But that's not, that's not an option right now. So that would be really nice if you could do that. And you can see here, this health check script is a variable. We're going to look at that in a second. Um, but just note, like, that's not actually a script or, or something like that. There's, it's a variable, and um, we'll see it in, in a minute, a little bit later. Here's a couple example health checks um, that you might use. The one on the left is for a Postgres database. The one on the right is for just any kind of arbitrary web server. Um, you would probably want to expand on this. This is doing very basic checks for you. So on the left, it basically makes sure that it can connect to the database. If you say echo like select one into PSQL um, with all these arguments, um, if you can't connect to the database, that will fail and, and exit with like a non-zero non exit status. And then you check that afterwards. These are just, by the way, um, they're written in bash. They're very simple. You can write them in any language as long as your, your script is executable. So if you have like a, a Node.js or an Express application, you can write your health check in Node because that, that's already going to be um, in your container. What I would avoid is, oh, I have a, a, a Java application that I'm, that I'm running. Don't like write your health check in Node and then you're like, now I have to run Node and Java. Like that's, no, don't do that. Um, try, to, try to avoid bringing in extra libraries. Um, so you might want to do more. You might want to actually check the data in the database, make sure the data hasn't become corrupted. Um, or that like all the, your schema is correct. So you might want to do more, but this is just very generic. And the same thing in your, in your web server. You might want to do more. This is basically just um, fetching a file, uh, making a request, and then making sure that your response code comes back um, 200 OK. So that's, that's really simple. But you might also want to do other things like, are my redirects working correctly? Like, are my pretty URLs working? Like, that's something that you might want to check. 
you might want to check that like the thing that you're that you're getting is actually the thing you would expect to get. And what's nice is these health check scripts run inside your container. So you have access to the whole container file system. So you can see what the file looks like on disk. And you can also see what the response looks like coming in from the web server. So you can compare those two things and make sure that you're actually getting what you, what you hope to get. Um, so that's, that's something that, that's worth checking as well. Demo. How am I doing on time? I think I have, I have time. We can do, we can do a, a demo here. Whoa, that is so small. Does everyone have supervision? I thought I was so prepared. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start up a simple service here. This should provision, hopefully. Uh, live demos are always great, <laughs> right? Um, so this started a service. It's a simple just web web service, and this is this service right now doesn't have any health checks in it. So this is just going to highlight the benefits of using health checks versus not using health checks, and in particular, um, how this will benefit your deployments, your rolling deploys. So if you have an application version one running, and you want to go to application version two, um, this is going to make sure that you don't have any downtime in there, and you don't have to do any like special tricks. Again, I'm not clever. I don't like being clever. Um, I like simple more than clever because it's, it's easier to understand. Um, so this is this is running. We can see where's my cursor. Yeah, I'm, I'm an idiot. So that's port uh, thirty thousand eleven. Is that right? Cool. So this is just you know quickly make it's making requests uh, to this web server, and you're seeing, yeah. It's, it's responding as you might expect, 200 OKs. Um, nothing really interesting going on here. Sorry, I don't have like cool hacker graphics and like the world exploding or something. But um, this, is, this is really when you're a developer, like you look at text all day and console stuff. Um, so, and then in the bottom right, I'm basically just looking at uh, the, the containers that are running on my local server. Everything's running on, on my laptop right now. So, um, this is just showing me, I have a container. It's been up for about a minute. It's called my health check. The version is uh, disabled because it's the health check has been disabled. So you can see it's all, it's all running. It's perfectly healthy. Um, now I'm just going to update the service. And I'm just going to update it to another version that also doesn't have um, a health check enabled. And what we'll see here is as this runs, we'll see in between, it's going to start up a second, second image. And all of a sudden, it's, it immediately thought it was healthy. It said, services converged. I think I'm healthy right away, but I'm not healthy. You, you can obviously see I'm not healthy because my request just immediately started failing. And that's because I built in some latency. I can show, if you're interested, I can show you the file. But I basically said, like, sit for 10 seconds and then start up your image, even though that like, primary process started up. So that's, that's Docker's built-in behavior. It says, like, your primary process is running. Pro process ID 1, um, that's running. So obviously, your container is healthy because you haven't told me via a health check that your container isn't healthy. Um, so it immediately thinks it's running, even though the actual web server, server wasn't running. And you can see pretty quick, like 10 seconds or so, um, it automatically recovered. And so that's, that's kind of the no health check. That's a default behavior you would get. And that's what a lot of people might, might experience when they, when they go to deploy or upgrade their first application. They're like, I read all the docs. It said it would be like zero downtime. It, wouldn't, it, would, it would spin everything up. I did everything right. Why isn't it working? Well, it's probably because of your health check. Um, so now I'm just going to do this with the, uh, I think it's enabled. I should have I double checked this. But uh, I'm going to do this, and we're going we're to deploy it with a health check this time. And you can see here, or what you should not see is any errors. It's going to be hard to kind of know, but you can just look at the date stamp. It's ticking once a second. It's making a request. And it's actually sitting here. It didn't say the services converged. It waited about like 10 seconds or whatever that, that delay is that I built in. It waited about 10 seconds. And then it's like, ah, oh, now you're healthy um, because this, the service has actually come up. And what we didn't see in the top right was any failures. Like we didn't see any of those errors coming back. And so that kind of demonstrates uh, the zero downtime nature of this. Now, 
there's a lot of little switches that we could put in. How many, like I'm only running one replica. That's why there's only one container there. I could run lots of replicas. I could do like six replicas and update three at a time or something like that. And it also depends if you like start your, your updates first or if you stop your updates first, that can lead to some downtime. So you have to do kind of like everything right. Um, I'm talking to my coworkers and they're like, why isn't it working? I'm like, because you're doing it wrong. That's why, you're, that's why it doesn't work. <laughs> um, so yeah, glad, glad uh, they were here to uh, hear you laugh at them. <laughs> so just gonna stop this and then we'll move on. So cool, demo, demo one, off without a hitch. That's fantastic. I took my cursor, it's red. Um, so entry point, entry point and command. These can kind of get a little bit confusing if you read the docs and you really have to understand what's going on with each one of them. Both of them can kind of do the same thing and they both have two forms, an exec form and a shell form. I'd say always, and Docker also, they agree with me because I'm right. Um, always use the exec form. Don't use the shell form. Shell form is going to be kind of a pain for you. Uh, one of the things that it's going to do is it's going to kind of like put that shell process ID in, in process ID one, and it's not going, it's going to mess up signal processing, which we're also going to talk about in a minute here. Um, so always use the exec form. And then what I would recommend is you use entry point to specify the uh, executable that you, want, that you want to be basically process ID one. It's, it, it, it is basically your, your application. Um, and also use it to, to provide any arguments that are required for that execu executable. So say you want you like have to use like a dash D to, to daemonize your, your application. Make that a required argument. Um, and then use any things that are like customizable, like, oh, do I wanna like switch the port? Like I'll give it a good default port 80 or something like that. But if, you know, if, if a user wants to have a customized port when they run it, maybe let them put it in and they could, they could put a different port uh, as like port 443 or port 8000 or something like that, right? So that's what you would, that's what you would use it. And basically what happens is when you type out a command like docker run image name and then anything after that image name basically will override the stuff that you put into command. So if you put in your executable into the command, then it allows them to basically do different things with your container, which isn't a bad thing. And by doing what I'm recommending with the entry point, um, you can still, a, a user can still override what your entry point is. They just use a dash dash entry point um, flag when they're starting up the container. So we're not like cutting them off at the knees and like, oh, you cannot do things with my container. We're just kind of giving them good defaults so that it works out of the box and then we're letting them customize it. So we could talk a little bit more about that if we, if we had time, but if you have questions, you can, you can certainly ask, ask me about those um, now or later, whatever, um, or not at all. The last little bit here is configuration and bootstrapping. And this kind of goes hand in hand with the previous slide um, on the entry point. So what do I mean by configuration and bootstrapping? Um, if I'm going to run, wow, I got loud. Um, if I'm going to run my application, say Nginx, for example, I'm not going to put Nginx as my uh, entry point command. I'm going to write what what I call, or we typically call, a Docker entry point script. It's example there. And then what we'll actually do is we'll start, we'll do some bootstrapping in there, which gives us the opportunity to um, customize our application write customized configurations based on where it's being deployed or whatever, um, change things if we need to change anything in our application at startup time um, for customizations. Um, and we can also do hooks. So we can have like a real generic kind of like Angular based application and then we can customize it through hooks. So I don't have to rewrite my entire image every time I want to deploy a new Angular application. I can just kind of rewrite it through, um, re-customize it through some hooks. Um, Keep in mind that when you do this bootstrapping, your Docker entry point script in this example um, does become your, your primary process ID. So that's the thing that um, Docker is going to watch. Um, if, that, if that process exits, your container is gone. So don't let your process exit. Um, we'll see this in, in a second here. 
here. Um, don't let your process exit because if your process exits, your container will immediately stop. This is an example. This is kind of small too. This is this is an example Docker entry point that we that we use in one of our applications, um, and it does a lot of configuration for us. So, one of the things here is it's like writing out a con an nginx configuration file, it's nginx conf directory, um, and kind of customizing your application. So we're setting some expires headers. This is you know if you've deployed Angular applications, this is an Angular application. So. Um, we're doing this to kind of write some, some uh, rewrites in order to serve your application correctly. And then we also do some pretty interesting things. I don't know, interesting, clever, four-letter word. Um, to proxy pass, and this is, this is for our users. So this, this, this bit here that I'm showing you is, is so that if you go out and downloaded this application and started running it from, from an image, it would work because a lot, of, a lot of the data we're pulling is coming from our website. Um, and so we, we set up these proxies. So if you at, look for slash FDSNWS, um, you're not going to have that. You're not loading all this data into your image. Um, you're, it's not accessible to you. But through a proxy, um, it just says, instead of going locally for FD, FDSNWS, just head over to the Earthquake website. Um, you can get the data from us there. That's a URL. Um, you can totally use it. And then down here, we have this health check. And so. I'm actually dynamically dynamically writing the health check. Um, that's a little bit so you can customize it instead of having like a, you could just have a script on disk, but you might need to do different things like maybe your, your application is listening on a, on a different port or something like that, or it's a random port, or you want people to be able to customize that port. If that's an option where you say like, oh, I'm going to let you do that through an environment variable, an argument. Um, we talked about that earlier. We'll talk about it a little bit more later. Um, your health check needs to know which port to use, right? You can't just hard code that someplace because your health check would suddenly fail. You're like, your health check's like, I'm hitting port 80. It's not accessing. It's like, well, yeah, because I'm listening on port 443. Where have you been? Um, it's like, I was statically written, buddy. Um, <laughs> another thing we're doing here is Again, this is an Angular application. If you if you write Angular applications, um, you might know a little bit about this. But there's this like deploy URL and this base href URL that kind of says like, on my site. If your if your whole site is Angular, this isn't a big deal. But if your site is running a whole bunch of content and then in one directory is where you want your Angular application to be deployed, you use this like base href property in your build when you're building Angular, right? Um, the hard thing is is we want our application to be Anyone can use it. So we're running it on our website, and it's at slash earthquakes slash event page um, is, where, is where the application is, is available. Maybe you want to put it at some place called like slash event or slash totally not from the USGS. I did this all on my own. Um, you could do that, and we're allowing you to do that by, by, by writing this uh, dynamically for you. And so you would just have to kind of be consistent. Uh, you can do that. Probably that's, I'm not, that's left as an exercise to the user. That's my favorite thing. Um, to say. The last little bit here, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, is signal processing. Again, this Docker entry point shell script is the thing that, that Docker no considers my primary process. It's process ID 1. Um, when you say Docker container stop, or if, if you're like upgrading and Docker internally has to stop con and start containers, he's going to signal this process. Um, Bash by itself isn't going to do a whole lot with that signal. It'll just be like, OK, I'm dead. Uh, so what we're doing is we're actually trapping that signal, and then we're forwarding it along to Nginx. Now, this is a little bit contrived. Nginx can do signal processing itself, and it has different signals for like reload, graceful restarts, and you just send it, send it the proper signal. That's done through the stop signal instruction in your Docker file. Um, but yeah, Nginx could do this itself. I'm kind of showing it here to show you how you might do this if you, like, maybe say you wrote some other application that, or you're using some software that doesn't do, handle signals in the proper way. Um, you can do some more graceful shutdowns. And by graceful shutdowns, what I mean is, like, you don't want to cut off, like, a kill minus nine um, in flight connections, right? Like, if, if someone's made a request to your server and then 
it's in the process of like getting served and, and getting sent back and it's halfway through and you're like you're done uh, the user is going to be upset it's like well like what happened it was all working and now it's not working and maybe that's okay if you're like just de undeploying an application like that application is crap get rid of it um, maybe it's okay that it like stops working a half a second earlier um, for one user um, but if you're upgrading your application you want it to stay up you don't want someone to be like why was it down it goes down for like two seconds every time I upgrade my application. That's that's not not so good, and that'd be because like it would be turning off your containers and, and shutting off those in-flight connections. So you definitely don't want to uh, to cut them off like that. You want to have graceful shutdowns, graceful startups, um, and that's what we can do here. And you can see at the bottom, uh, I'm just grabbing that child process ID and then I'm waiting on the child because if I didn't wait on the child, then my script would exit and my container would shut down and my application would never be healthy and I would be really annoyed. Um, so yeah. That's gonna kind of wrap up the basics of like building an image. I think I missed showing you guys a, uh, the Docker file. I don't know where that link was, but I missed it somehow. But this is a Docker file and I wanted to show this. I said I would show this and so I'm, I'm gonna kind of circle back. Um, you see at the top, how we're using like base, these build um, arguments here before you're from, right? And so this is how I'm customizing it. So this is what we put into uh, GitHub. This is out on GitHub. It's a public repository. You could go there if you wanted to. And it's just a USGS, that's our organization on Docker Hub, um, Node version eight and USGS Nginx and implicitly that means latest. Uh, so just the latest version of our, of our Nginx image. Um, but again, even though that's in our organization on Docker Hub, that's not what we're gonna, going to use as our base images when we actually build our applications and deploy our applications. We're gonna switch those through those build arguments and use our internal registry. Um, and the next thing down here is our build environment. So this is saying, okay, use the builder image um, and we'll just alias build env. There's nothing special about build env. You can call it my, my really cool stage or whatever you wanna call it. Um, but yeah, this is just basically our build, and that's going to say our build image is Node. Because again, this is an Angular application, so we're going to start with Node so that we can compile our Angular application. And I just run npm run build blah blah blah. There's the base href that we were talking about. And then this base href is actually, it's not a variable at this point. At this point, it actually is the literal text base underscore href. Um, so that's what it is, and that's what goes into it. And then you saw in that Docker entry point how we're actually changing that base href in what we built. Um, then we get to the actual application image. And so this is our from image. So this is now Nginx. Now we're, run, now we're starting over, basically, in Nginx. And this guy, everything that happened up here is still available to us if we, if we reference it as the build environment. We set, set a couple variables. And then we go ahead and uh, just copy stuff out. So we're copying stuff, and we showed this earlier, um, pretty much the exact same lines, copying stuff from the build environment into our, our deployed image. So that's, that's kind of how that all works. The other thing to kind of keep in mind is uh, you never want to run your applications as the root user. There's some exploits where if you run your container as a root user and your container gets compromised, that attacker can then have access to the host system as root user. I'm not gonna go into the details of how that can happen, but it's, it's a thing. Um, more than don't run it as the root user, don't run it as any user that exists on the host. Um, because then, then you won't have these permission kind of like overrides or conflict or anything like that. And you, and you also won't get confused. You're like, why doesn't it work? I'm, I'm running it as the Nginx user here and it's the Nginx user there and it's not working. Uh, it's like, because they're different users. If you actually look, they're different. They're going to be different user IDs, probably. And you can get lucky, and you can force things, and you can get clever. Um, but clever is, is a four-letter word the way I thought. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to go over that. I don't know where I missed that in my slides, but that was definitely something to talk about. And signal processing. I think we talked about signal processing. Okay, so 
that's that's our that's our image development. Now we have we have great images. We have the health checks. They're very flexible. Um, we can run them locally. We can run them on our production environment. You can run them as well if you would like. Um, now, how do we deploy it? <sighs> rocket ship taken off. Um, hopefully, there's no rocket scientists here because they're like that rocket's gonna crash. Um, they take off straight up. So aesthetically, though, I think this looks better. Um, I made it pop. Uh, so, <laughs> deploying. Basically, this comes down to like a YAML file to specify your deployment configuration, and I'm going to show you an example of that um, in a little bit, and I have a demo as well if we have time. Um, yeah, we'll just go ahead and get right to it. I don't like to read, read the slides too much. So, for example, I'm just going to show you here. Uh, in, the, in my environment, on my shell, in this example, I have a bunch of variables that are that are just there. So on my laptop, for example, I just have these variables, um, and there's there's others, and I'll point them out as we go through the next slides. Um, but I just wanted to kind of point that out. That's on the host machine that's running Docker. Um, it's not inside the Docker image itself or anything like that. Um, and it could also just be inside the script that's that's running on the host machine that's running Docker, right? So you can just export variables in, in shell or create environment variables in, in Java, things like that. Um, and then your deploy basically comes down to a simple command, docker stack deploy. Um, keep, that, keep that in mind. A stack is just a word for application. Um, prune says any services that are not included in, in my current deployment configuration, get rid of those services. Don't leave them hanging around. Don't just like assume I still need them even though they're not there. So maybe I had... Apache one time and, and Nginx this time because I switched. Um, if you didn't say prune, it would just leave all your Apache services running and bring up Nginx as well next to it. So prune, that seems like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, with registry auth, this is really important when you're using internal registries or, or private registries because you need to send some credentials, right? Like they're, they're private. It's not for anyone in, in the world to, to pull your images. Um, so you need to, to provide a username and password. So on the command line, I'm logged in on my, on my machine. But I might be deploying to a swarm that has like six or seven machines in it, right? You have to make sure that you're logged in on all of those machines as well because when you actually deploy, it's, you're going to say, hey, machine over here, um, deploy this container. And you'll be like, cool, what's that image? Oh, oh, it's over on your internal registry. Let me download it. And your registry will be like, no thanks because you're not authorized. So that's important in order to use that with registry auth because then it will actually pass your current login credentials to any of your nodes in your cluster. And then you can do different things. Like you can, you can say like, oh, like um, my, my authentication credentials can only pull like the latest or something. So I can only deploy into different, different environments or whatever. So you can kind of do role-based um, authentication. And most platforms give you this. Kubernetes gives you this. Um, Pivotal gives you this, where you can kind of have like role-based credentials in, in like what you can do in, in terms of deployments. Um, resolve image, that makes sure that you have the right image every time. It doesn't just assume that you have the right image because you have the same name. Um, it actually checks the, the hashes. And then it's a deployment file. This is my deployment file, deployment.yaml, and my application is called uh, my cool app. So that's the, the basic setup here. Um, here is the YAML file that was referenced there. And you can see in this YAML file, uh, the image is using variables. Those variables are coming from the host environment. Um, they're not necessarily um, variables that are going to be available to your container that is actually going to be deployed or, or running. So those I can use those variables because they're available to me as a host environment. You can say some rep so replicas. I want three copies of this service. Um, I, I say I only want this these replicas to deploy to be deployed on nodes in my cluster that have some label with a value. Uh, so you can be specific there if you want to. If you're like, oh, I'm going to say like these nodes are my, my production and these nodes are my QC and these, these nodes are my, my dev or something like that. It's like only deploy to, to dev or something like that. Or maybe you have your high availability nodes and then your, your heavy processing loads or something like that. Um, you can say like this application is really important. Give him dedicated resources and don't let all these less important applications Come, come and get deployed onto the same servers and steal those resources away. So you might want to provision in that way. So you can do a lot of things uh, with your constraints. Some 
update restart policies. This is the one I want to really point out there is the order, order being start first. If you're running lots of replicas, maybe the order isn't as important. It depends on your parallelism. But basically, if, you only, if I only run one replica and I say stop first, when every time you go to deploy, even though we did the health checks right and everything else right, what it'll do is like, oh, you want to upgrade this container? Let me stop that container. It goes away. Your service is no longer running. Your users are no longer happy. Um, and now let me bring up another container. That's, that's not a great, great way to go. Um, but if you say start first, he says, oh, you're running. You want to upgrade? Let me just go ahead and bring up another, the, the upgraded version. And then when it becomes healthy, I'll take down the, the old version that you don't want anymore. So that's what we saw earlier in the demo. You can get away with doing stop first if you can run like multi multiple replicas and you do like less than less than that number in your parallelism. So if I'm running five replicas and I do uh, parallelism three, it will basically do tear down three immediately, bring up those three when they when they become healthy, it'll tear down the last two and bring up the last two. Now you might have some degradation in service. If you need all five of those all the time, then you probably don't want to do that. But if you're like, I can probably get by with one or two, then you can then, then you can kind of run it that way and say a stop first. And that could be important if your host machine doesn't have enough resources to run extra copies all the time. Um, so just something to keep in mind. The next part is the environment. Now these are variables that I want to basically create as environment variables in the container that I'm starting. So you can use, you can hard code them, obviously. You could just say like, you know, name equals value and just hard code that in. What I'm doing here actually is using variables from my host system. So again, on the shell on my Mac has a variable called like DB host in the environment, Postgres user and PG password. If you just say the variable name, it will actually create a variable of that same name and um, look for what's in the environment and just use that same value. So I'm going to have, it, that's basically the same thing as saying dbhost equals dbhost. Um, but it's a little bit of a shorthand. Maybe it's confusing. Typically, I like to just write out dbhost equals dbhost because um, I like it to be clear and simple. I don't want to be like, well, what's that? Is that like a variable or is that just a, is that a key value? I don't understand. So. I just showed it there for an example, and that's the only one because it's like typically I do it the other way, and especially you might need to rename these. Like my host system has has a variable called db password, but you know my database actually needs a variable called pg password. Um, so you can you can rename them that way. Ports is pretty obvious, but the subtlety here is like I'm not specifying the port. I'm letting the the Docker swarm choose the port at once because if you specify the ports. You kind of have to keep track of that. And as you, you're deploying more and more applications into your cluster, you're like, OK, what ports do I have available? So, oh, man, let me look at all the services that are running right now and um, clean up all my ports. So that's important. Let that, let that pick the port for you for yourself or for automatically. And uh, last bit is configs. The configs actually go into the swarm, and they'll persist across um, updates and whatnot. So you can specify these configs. And they're kind of similar to environment variables, but environment vari variables are a little bit more like key value pairs. And these are like you can specify like a whole like configuration file. And it exposes it as basically what looks like a file um, inside the running container. And then uh, you can read that file and do things with that file. And that file could even be an executable that you, can, that you can run to do other things. And you can also use it outside. So your, your um, config that you attach to a service could be used um, by some other service that needs to take some action on, on your first service. I had a demo to show that. Uh, I think we're not going to have time. So service discovery is the last little bit here. Um, and this is going over the details of, OK, we chose a port at random. How do I then? know what that port was, that's the first command, and then also route my users to their application based on the path. So you come in and you, you say um, earthquake event pages in our example, and it says, OK, well, that path goes to application 1 on port 30,000, um, and it goes ahead and routes that for you. So uh, that's, that's a simple service discovery. And there's some magic um, that I could go into, but I think, I think we're running out of time. So. 
Um, that, I would just open it up to uh, so questions, if you have questions. If there's no questions and people want to stick around, I can show like the, the really short demo. Um, it goes pretty quick to kind of show this service discovery and everything like that. But yeah, thank you.